Hello, world. OK, so what is Toybox? Toybox is a fresh implementation of the Linux slash Android command line. It's BSD licensed. It draws from POSIX, the Linux standard base. It's good enough to build Linux from scratch. It needs to be able to replace Android's toolbox. It picks some stuff up from the bash man page, and so on. That's not the interesting question. The interesting question is, why is Toybox? The smartphone is replacing the PC. Mainframes were replaced by mini computers, which, are being, which were replaced by microcomputers, which are being replaced by smartphones. It's a standard disruptive technology cycle. The 8 to 16 bits to 32 bits to 64 bit things are sustaining technology changes within each cycle. But each time, you know, the PC wasn't good enough that the mainframe and mini computer people initially paid all that much attention to it. And they did a standard upward retreat, as described in The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen. <clears throat> it becomes more general purpose as it matures. The PC started out booting into ROM Basic. It didn't run native code. It didn't even have a real operating system. It grew out of ROM Basic. The, uh, the smartphone needs to grow out of Dolvik. Dolvik is this generation's ROM Basic. Uh, note that successful tablets are big phones, not small PCs. So, Attempting to move the, the previous generation's technology down into the new space, if you know anything about disruptive technologies, that tends not to work well. Uh, last time around, it was uh, the Microvax was an example of mini computer makers who made a PC form factor mini computer. That didn't help. In, in terms of ergonomics, the main objection to, you know, I can't use this, the keyboard's tiny and scrunchy, and I can't use it to replace a, a PC. It's got a USB hub on the end of it. Or, sorry, it's got a USB connection on the end of it. You plug it into a USB hub to charge it. Add a USB keyboard, a USB mouse, and a USB to HDMI converter, and you've got the hardware of a workstation. It's got a gigahertz processor, a gigabyte of RAM, and several gigs of storage in it already, and you can trivially add network mounts or USB drives or whatever else you want. Um, up here somewhere, I pre-opened several tabs that I would use and then lost track of which ones they were. Um, here we go. Oh, I have them in order the other way. Uh, this is an example of a USB display that's uh, 1024 by 768, plugs in USB, vanilla kernel has support for it now. There will be better ones coming along. Um, <clears throat> but that just gets you the hardware side. And yes, the hardware will improve. I'm sure that wireless charging is coming and the ability to associate with things via Bluetooth or something you know, will happen eventually so you don't have to actually plug it in, although that raises fun security issues. But right now you can do it through USB. But that doesn't give you the software side. The, the phone is not independent of the PC until it becomes self-hosting. The PC itself was initially cross-compiled, the software on it was cross-compiled from many computers, and then it grew out of ROM Basic to GW Basic and Quick Basic and all those, and that gave us Turbo C and Quick C until the OS itself could be built on the device, and it was self-hosting, and that's the point at which it no longer needed the mini computer. I, I note that uh, this uh, disruptive technology cycle that we've seen several times before it's not that the old platform goes away, it's that it's not what you have in front of you. People initially used to go stand in line to submit their punch cards to the mainframe operators and wait around for their printout to come back. And when you could sign up for a time slot at the mini computer terminal down the hall, you didn't need to do that anymore. You submitted your jobs to the mainframe through the mini computer. Then you, you didn't need the terminal down the hall when you had a machine on your desk. And now you don't need the machine on your desk when you have a machine in your pocket. But the software that Android needs to become self-hosting, uh, by the way, it's, oh, I'm jumping ahead. Uh, the software it needs to become self-hosting is four things. It needs, the, the smallest self-hosting system is a kernel, a set of command line tools to run configure and install and make is a bunch of shell scripts it calls out to. It needs a C library, and it needs a toolchain. These are the four things. If you saw the um, LLVM talk uh, a couple of sessions ago, uh, EGCS2 is LLVM. 
That's the new name of EGCS. That's probably the tool chain we're going to. Uh, for the C library, there's a project called the Musil libc that's about to have its 1.0 release. It's a BSD-licensed C library that already builds uh, the Linux from scratch project. And for command line, I'm writing Toybox, which we'll get into. So these are not yet solved, solved problems, but they are solvable problems. Why not just extend uh, Android's Toolbox and Android's Bionic C library? And the problem is there's nothing there. They're pretty much stubs. It's an intentionally locked down system because the, the smartphone is a billion unadministered, fully powered Linux systems with broadband access. From a security standpoint, they wanted to reduce their attack surface down as small as possible and shoehorn everybody into a Java VM sandbox, which is nice, but we have to outgrow that. And as we outgrow that, there are going to be issues that I'll get to. Um, the compiler is still a bit of a problem, but after seeing the LLVM talk from earlier, and if you didn't see it, go watch the video, I think that's probably what's going to win for now. I'll just skip that bit. Um, do we really care if Android or iPhone wins? Imagine if Microsoft was competent. That pretty much answers that thing. Apple sues bloggers who leak details about their upcoming things. Um, Steve Jobs' first act when he came back was to put power computing out of business. They had licensed clones and that stopped. Apple does not see Linux as an existential threat, but the Apple versus Franklin decision is what created proprietary software in the first place in 1983 by extending copyright to cover binaries, which were previously considered just a number. That's not copyrightable. Everything before that was open source because source could be copyrighted and binaries couldn't. Uh, the whole founding of the Free Software Foundation in 1983 was actually a conservative reactionary movement to changes in the industry. Yes, it was right. That it, was, it was a good thing to oppose, but that doesn't necessarily make them visionary. Um, what's happening right now is that there's something in business called an S-curve, where if you, if you chart the market share of something or the number of, of units, it looks like a big S. Uh, even if, if you pro plot it on log paper, it looks like you know, a uh, gradual thing. And if you don't plot it on log paper, it just shoots up off the top of the thing. This is pretty much what happens when you get a period of exponential growth. Periods of exponential growth are always finite because you will run out of atoms in the planet. Uh, we, will, we will run out of people who could benefit from a smartphone who don't already have one in a finite number of doublings because there's only so many people on the planet. Uh, it does turn out that there are more pockets than desks though. So we're definitely going to have more phones than PCs could potentially ever have grown to. And when the S-curve flattens out again, this is standard business stuff, when the S-curve flattens out again, whichever platform has the largest market share at that point is probably going to continue to grow to become the de facto standard because there's a positive feedback loop to being the biggest one in any platform that has substantial network effects. Uh, the telephone is the standard example of network effects. One phone is useless, two phones can only call each other. But when you have three phones, each phone can call two other phones. So every phone you add to a connected network makes every other phone slightly more valuable. And the largest net, you know, there is an exponential growth in value to the size of the network. It's not squared, it's, a, it's slightly larger than one, but it's still really cool. And this positive feedback creates de facto standards that are natural monopolies. And you can be as sucky as Windows 3.1 and still be nailed to 90% market share just because everybody wants what everybody has. You know, people write software for whatever has the most seats. People buy whatever has the most support. There are, you can argue that um, putting everything in the browser that, you know, uh, Java's right once, one everywhere will save us. People have been trying to get away from that for a long time, but I'm not counting on that. So, question. Android is not vanilla Linux, and we've all been doing vanilla Linux. Do we want to oppose that, or do we want to accept it? There are several reasons vanilla Linux didn't succeed on the phone and isn't going to. 
Um, one of them is that it's probably too late for a new entrant because we do have established winners. Uh, as we have established leaders with a significant uh, lead, and it's most likely to be a winner-take-all thing when the, when the music stops. This is the third generation of Mac versus PC. The first generation was the Apple II versus the S100 CPM systems. Then we had Mac versus PC. Now we have iPhone versus Android. We've had purists before who said that, you know, uh, DOS isn't CPM 16 or Linux clone, you know, Linux isn't a real Unix. And that hasn't really been a winning argument. Uh, I mentioned that the Microvac shows that disruption goes up market, not down. Um, Unity and Windows 8 suck both at being desktops and at being phones. A and that's a real problem. OpenMoco was out, was our Windows CE. It was out before iPhone and Android, and Linux in the phone didn't really take off there. There's a significant problem with pre-installs which is that you need channel partners, and they're all basically claimed, and getting your thing through a channel partner has some serious latency of multiple years. Um, Steve Jobs was dealing with AT&T to do the iPhone back around 1995. And, you know, it, it's been a decade, and almost two, I think. Um, other thing, there's a major problem. The open source development model cannot do user interfaces. I actually have a, a longish write-up about this part that I don't have time to go into. But essentially, any time shut up and show me the code is not the correct response to the problem at hand, the open source development model melts down into one of three distinct failure modes. We either have endless discussion that never resolves, we have everybody goes off and implements their own idea, and then we can't unify them after the fact either. Or, and this is my favorite one, delegating the problem to nobody, where you separate the engine from the interface and concentrate on the engine and hope that some glorious day someone writes an interface that's nice. Or you make it so configurable that the fact that you still don't know everything it can do after a week of study and it still no, has no sane defaults is now somehow your fault. Open source doing user interfaces is like Wikipedia trying to write a novel. It doesn't work that way. We have solved portions of Brooke's Law, but too many cooks still make the soup taste bad. We've solved the nutrition aspect, but the aesthetic thing, our model is built around defeating Brooke's Law with distributed, disconnected, development nodes that feed together and then have empirical tests where everyone can agree this is the best way to go. When you're dealing with aesthetic issues and there aren't empirical tests saying this is the one true superior approach out of all of these, when it just matters that you pick something and be consistent and pull it off well, it's like Chinese food isn't better than Mexican food, but if you can't pick which one you're cooking, the end result may not be fun. Um, I, I could spend a lot of time on this, but I, I don't have it. Let's just say that <laughs> Linux on the desk, we've had the year, of the, Linux, uh, the year of the Linux desktop 20 times now, and the fact that we still haven't broken 1% or 2% market share is a systemic problem. Android doesn't have that problem because Android does have one novelist dictating the plot. Android does have you know, somebody in charge. Um, we've had several projects that had somebody in charge in open source development. I remember Mozilla wasn't considered particularly useful. Galleon forked off of that. Mozilla rebased on it and went, okay, the committee is in charge of the decisions again. Firefox forked off of that, and then Mozilla went, okay, we're, we, we like what you're doing, but the committee is going to be in charge again. And, well, committees produce beige. If you're lucky, committees produce beige. If you're unlucky, they produce the DMV. Okay, so enough of that. Um, so question, um, so put, trying to replace Android with vanilla Linux, given what we have now, and given that precluding the iPhone from becoming the new de facto standard helps us avoid a world of lockdown hardware and software, we probably want to get behind Android and push and do what we can to clean up later because Android is at least salvageable. 
Android is not open source development. It's regularly updated abandonware, but we can fork it any time if we need to, and we may be able to get stuff through Google's not invented here navel gazing if we shout loud enough, maybe. Okay, so Android is not copyleft. Is this something we're going to oppose or something we're going to accept? Well, there's a problem. The GPL was a category killer. It was synonymous with copyleft the way GCC became the de facto standard compiler, the way Exchange became the de facto standard spreadsheet, and so on. Um, there's no the GPL anymore. GPLv2 was a terminal node in a directed graph, directed graph of license convertibility. You essentially all you had to know as an engineer is, is this license GPL compatible or not? If it's not, ignore it. If it is, treat it as GPL. And we're good. We don't have to be a lawyer. Well, there's no, GP, there's no the GPL anymore. The Linux kernel and Samba can't share code, even though they implement two ends of the same protocol. QEMU is stuck between wanting to suck in code from the Linux kernel to implement its virtual devices, it wants to suck in driver code, and it wants to suck in platform definition code from binutils and GCC to, imp to implement its virtual processors, and it can't take code from both. There's no universal receiver license anymore. You know, people say, well, just do GPLv2 or later. Then you can't take code from either one. That's not an improvement. So what a lot of people have done is they have jumped, for, in the absence of a universal receiver, they've jumped to the other end, universal donor. That's BSD or similar licensing, staying as close to public domain as you can. Um, there are a lot of people who are actually going, um, the most common license on GitHub is not specifying any license at all because they're taking the Napster approach and going copyright's too dumb to live. It's like the patent law. You know, the only thing you can do is civil disobedience and hope it goes away. Um, I'm not convinced that's a good idea. I mean, there's other people who are saying that uh, maybe this will be a replacement for GPL3. So, okay, yeah, additional fragmentation, that's going to help. So you have a bunch of incompatible terminal nodes. What's essentially happening is copyleft is dying. And Android's no GPL in user space, that's not necessarily their original reason for doing it. But at the same time, attempting to, to solve the problem of copyleft now being badly fragmented into incompatible camps, I don't think we can. I think going with, okay, we need a BSD licensed user space is pretty much our option given the tight time deadline of we really want to be in on this. We, we really want to steer this transition. We want to capture this transition so we don't get locked out of future generations. Uh, so in the absence of universal receiver, people are going with the universal donor. Okay. So why not extend uh, Toolbox and Bionics instead of replace it? I, I mentioned that a little bit. Um, the security issue I talked about as, as the phone outgrows Dalvik, the way the PC outgrew ROM Basic, and runs native code that it can build itself, that opens the can of worms of security issues now that we have broadband internet access. The, the solution that looks like the best thing is uh, Linux containers, because that's a generic solution to making the system nest. Attempting to break up root into a bunch of capability bits, while it's nice, a bunch of people have pointed out that about half those capability bits are equivalent to having root because from there you can, you can crack root as it is now. It's kind of like saying we have, you know, we had one fireplace that we were paying very close attention to make sure that it didn't burn the place down, but we decided that was bad, so we gave everybody their own handheld canned heat thing. So everybody has a little fire and, this, and that makes everything much more fireproof now. I'm, I'm not convinced about that. Um, my problem with SE Linux is that um, you don't get watertight by plugging the holes in a colander. I, I don't like the direction of the approach. It increases the complexity of the system and we're talking unadministered systems. So if you need, you know, 20,000 SE Linux rules in a stock Red Hat Enterprise install or whatever the number is these days, um, 
are you sure you've guessed everything and are you sure that this won't be your own security system performing a denial of service attack on new software that you attempt to install that you do want to work? Okay, these are unadministered systems making them more complicated. I'm not convinced is the best approach. But this is an area that the problem with Linux containers is that I can't really do an analysis of is this sufficient or is this not because it's not done yet. It's still cooking. Linux containers shows an awful lot of promise and it's something that the kernel guys are pushing really hard and it's something that Android can get by resyncing with upstream. The thing about the Android kernel is it's the vanilla kernel plus stuff. They didn't remove anything, they just added stuff. So if vanilla solves some of these problems, Android has a history of taking that if they didn't already implement their own solution that they feel like doing. Um, but anyway, this is why in the, in the 1.0 release of Toybox, I'm not really paying attention to SE Linux. I am paying attention to containers. If it turns out necessary to add SE Linux, I can be talked into it, but that's a huge amount of work that I'm hoping to be able to avoid. And I'll get into the reasons why in a bit. You know, as I said, this, that one's a judgment call. So what we need out of, out of all that earlier, here's the problem set we're trying to solve, um, Musil is being developed by a guy named Rich Felker. Uh, he's Dalius on Freenode. He's doing a very good job at making a very competent C library that should be able to replace Bionic. The LLVM guys are going full bore at making a GCC replacement that could actually be pre-installed. The, uh, the problem with GPL licensed software, GPLv2 or GPLv3, is you'll never get pre-installed through the vendors unless they violate the Android policy of no GPL in user space, which most of them don't want to do. So you, if you get BSD licensed ones, it can actually be a vendor specific install on top of the base Android thing, or it has the potential of being integrated into base Android, either by come up with something like Cyanogen mod um, that is, is a rebuild with extra work, you know, a layer on top of the Android open source project. And the Android open source project is, in, is a Google internal consumer of the Android development whose job is to export it. And then if vendors like Samsung or something wanted to rebase on essentially something like the Alan Cox kernel instead of the Linux kernel, if they wanted to rebase on Cyanogen mod instead of raw, the raw Google thing, I don't know. That, that's a whole political layer that can be dealt with later, how you get these things upstream. But I do know what the constraints are that will prevent it from being upstream. So we need a BSD licensed command line implementation that has to be simple, readable, security audible, and minimize the attack surface, but provide more than Android Toolbox does now by a couple orders of magnitude. Well, order and a half. Uh, the, the simpler and more readable it is, the easier it is to security audit. And if you have a billion Android devices out there, worms and viruses going through them, if people start doing online banking through, through this thing, you don't want anybody installing key loggers and packet sniffers and stuff like that. It, it is an enormous issue. And the way to deal with security is, is make it so everybody can understand exactly what the code is doing at first glance. Uh, spot single point of truth means you only need to change it once. A thing about code reuse, um, it's good if it accomplishes single point of truth and making code simple and readable and, and not redundant and things like that. It's bad if it makes you pull in code you don't need. A lot of people go, code reuse is good, therefore I'm going to reuse code I never had a first use for. So they suck in 12 different dependent libraries that it's like, okay, I'm only using 3K of this library and it's 70K library. So there's a lot of code I'm pulling in that needs to be installed on the system that could potentially be called, but I'm not actually using it. Minimizing your build dependencies, minimizing your environmental dependencies is actually a good thing. And these are, these are lessons from, from raw BusyBox. Um, I, I maintained the BusyBox project for a couple of years. I put out the 101 through 122 releases. You probably already knew that. Um, so a, a lot, of, I'll, I'll get into, when I, when I get back to the Toybox specific parts, I'll start about why, talk about why I started Toybox. But a lot of this I learned on BusyBox. BusyBox already does some of it. 
but it's got the wrong license and it's lost a lot of the simplicity. Okay, um, another thing, if def considered harmful, the Linux kernel guys already know this. There's a, there's a famous paper called if def considered harmful. You know, BusyBox is full of if defs now. Um, you don't want your code to be full of if defs because it makes it really hard to audit and see what it's doing. Uh, we need good support for Linux containers, although this is mostly transparent from within. So it's possible that if we don't have time, you know, the upstream LXC project, if they get that working on Android, the correct response may be just, okay, use that and then run Toybox in the containers. It doesn't have to be integrated. It should be a drop-in replacement for Android Toolbox, uh, just on general principles. Um, it should be sufficient for self-hosting a development environment. Um, remember, a significant part of the point of the exercise is so that the smartphone can be independent of the PC so that it can replace the PC, so that we can actually use smartphones as workstations. If it can't rebuild the OS that's on the phone itself, your development environment is not real. It should be standards compliant. It should have uh, no external dependencies, I, I mentioned, not even ncurses and zlib. Um, to avoid the code reuse that isn't actually reuse because there's no re, there's just use. Um, it should probably be a multi-call binary um, that can be statically linked and dropped on a system. Uh, in part, this basically just allows you to add it more easily to a system that doesn't have it. Uh, it's generally a nice thing to have. You, you can multi-call binary versus non-multi-call binary is just, a, is just a packaging step. You can change that later. Um, I, I note that I did try making some of these command shell script snippets. That gets into level of detail we're not going. Uh, and it should be portable between Linux and Linux, by which I mean Android Linux versus vanilla Linux versus different distros. If there's ever a 4.0 release, it should still build cleanly. Um, I'm not particularly worried about portability to all the strange Unixes that the GNU tools have this huge configure step for where they're probing for the existence of the same header three times because is the header, the, does the header exist? Is the header usable? U, usable? And then the third one just says probing for the header in a way that, what are the first two doing? The, the huge configure steps of the, the wide variety of environments that this builds in, well, you want to depend on your build environment being compliant with POSIX 2008, and if it isn't, fix your build environment. You want to, your tool chain to be C99. If it isn't, fix your tool chain. We do want to try building with GCC and LLVM and PCC and stuff if possible, but special casing a bunch of different platforms rather than re relying on standards is not necessarily a good way to go. Um, Okay, so now, we get, now we've gotten through the first main part of the why, we get back to what is Toybox? What is the one quarter of this prog problem that I have bitten off and determined to solve for myself? You know, someone else is taking the C library, someone else is taking the tool chain, and the, and the um, actually Tim Bird, the founder of Self, uh, has an Android upstreaming project where he's attempting to bring the Android kernel and the vanilla Linux kernel closer together, both by adding stuff to, to the Android kernel that it doesn't do, but most vanilla systems do, or in, in the Android user space, and pushing patches upstream into vanilla that have been languishing in Android for a long time. Other people are doing that part, I'm doing Toybox. So Toybox started in 2006 when I left BusyBox. I decided that I could do a better job than BusyBox by starting over. I had other reasons for leaving BusyBox, Bruce Perens, but um, the reason I started Toybox is I believed that I could do a, a cleaner, simpler version than what BusyBox had become. BusyBox had explored its problem space experimentally and by the time the project was 10 years old, BusyBox had a pretty good idea of what it should do and a lot of scar tissue left over from finding its way. So a lot of what I did on BusyBox was actually cleanup work and there was still so much more cleanup work to do and as a large user base was pulling it in many different directions, it was developing scar tissue faster than I could clean it up from conflicting users. It, 
Alan Cox said that a maintainer's job is to say no. I like to use the analogy of um, I submit my short stories to a magazine and the editor picks a small subset of them and mostly bounces them back with a letter saying, you know, I'm rejecting this, but if you make these changes, I'll look at it again. And a personalized rejection letter is a good thing. Um, open source development works that way a lot. A maintainer has to do an awful lot of saying no to clearly define what is part of this project and what isn't and how do I want the design to look and how do I want the implementation to look. Um, and it's really hard, and, and your users are always pushing in different directions uh, than you necessarily want to go. It, it's hard. I mothballed the original Toy Box project starting around 2008. It tailed off for a long time because I'd proved that I could do a better job than BusyBox, but BusyBox was there. It had a 10-year head start. It was good enough. It had years of my own work in it. It had essentially a dozen full-time developers, a very large established user base, and you couldn't displace it by being incrementally better, and I really didn't want to sabotage my hand-picked successor, who's a great guy with, you know, pretty reasonable technical judgment. Um, he just doesn't keep the code as clean as I like. But, you know, pretty much I had many other things to do with my time, and the toy box work tailed off, and I actually tried to push a significant amount of it upstream into BusyBox. Um, BusyBox is using the toy box patch command, for example. The changes to BusyBox so that all the definition of one command was in one C file, and you could just drop one C file into the BusyBox source code, and the build would automatically pick it up and offer you the menu config op option, and it would generate the help text for you from that thing. And, you know, the command would show up in the multiplexer and all that kind of thing just from, you know, one file completely separate. That was toy box stuff that I explained to Dennis Vlazenko here itself in 2010. We finally got to, to get together and go, okay, here's what I was going for. And he added it to a busy box in a way that I consider less clean than toy box, but a lot of that infrastructure went upstream. Um, toy box was relaunched in November 2010 when Tim Bird looking, you know, okay, we need to extend vanilla kernel to better, the vanilla kernel to better support Android, we need to extend the Android user space to better be a, you know, Linux system, came to me talking about his proposed bento box project, which was going to extend Android's toolbox to be, to do a lot of what BusyBox did. And I pointed out to him that I spent years working on Toybox. I have a significant head start here, and I've done the research for everything else I need to do. I just haven't implemented it yet. And I own the copyrights to all this code. I only had like five other contributors, so I could contact four of them. I couldn't contact the fifth, so I had to remove his code, which I feel bad about. Um, but I could triage it. I could relicense it to something compatible with the Android user space licensing guidelines. And I could take it from there. And the reason I got involved in BusyBox development in the first place was due to a project that's currently called Aboriginal Linux, uh, Aborigine, you know, from the beginning, um, where basically I was creating the smallest self-hosting development environment. I built Linux from scratch, and then I went, well, can I replace all these GNU tools with BusyBox and UC Libc and stuff? The answer at the time was no, so I fixed it. And I spent years fixing it, and you know, I, I can do it again. A lot of those commands I wrote all of the code of with no external contribution. I could just port them to Toybox and did for a lot of them. And others, you know, I wrote the BusyBox mount implementation. It wasn't all my code, but I know exactly what's involved when I get the time to do that one. Um, and he was actually thinking, okay, well, maybe I can, you know, rustle up some corporate interest in helping out here. And some of the FSF guys who were totally unwilling to accept that uh, GPLv3's main effect was to undermine GPLv2 um, freaked. Because one of the things I had done as BusyBox maintainer was to start a round of license enforcement lawsuits because Eric Anderson, the previous maintainer, had left me the Hall of Shame, which was a list of these people are shipping BusyBox and never gave a source code. And it was years old, and you know, he was trying to publicly shame them, which, yeah, that'll work really well with a for-profit corporation. Um, and I went, okay, I can't maintain the Hall of Shame, so I asked Pamela Jones of Grok Law, 
can I get some legal representation pro bono? And she pointed me at this new thing, the Software Freedom Law Center, where Eben Moglen, the co-author of uh, the, the original GPLv2, had started distancing himself from the FSF. He used to run the FSF, FSF's legal arm. He now spun it off into an independent entity. And I went, OK, fine. Contact these people and see if you can shake source out of them. And over the next year, we got source releases from a dozen or more different companies. And not one line of code went into BusyBox as a result of this. Because the code that they had was useless. I mean, OK, yeah, they, they took a random SVN snapshot, ported some more stuff back from a future SVN thing, commented out a bunch of lines. We were using Subversion at the time for source control. Commented out a bunch of stuff, hardwired in some constants because they didn't know how to use the config system, and made some comments that made no sense. None of it we wanted in our tree. We just wanted to see what they'd done. So I actually, since then, uh, posted some mails to the list that that went into the BusyBox web page about, OK, the policy of BusyBox with regard to the GPL, we're not going to sue you like the FSF sued the MEPIS distribution for partnering with Debian and not mirroring the Debian source tarballs that they hadn't modified. The FSF actually took legal action against MEPIS for not mirroring unchanged code. And I went, OK, we're not going to do that. All we want to know is what are you shipping? What did you do with it? If it's vanilla, unmodified, just tell us and we're fine. Bradley uh, has since removed that from the BusyBox fact. Um, his only actual patches to the, uh, the Git repository that it's in um, were clarifications that took out the safe harbor provisions I'd added because, well, they got lots of money every time they sued one of these guys. So no code, but a self-financing legal machine that continues to sue people to this day, as far as I know, and wouldn't stop when I asked, because there were other people with copyrights who signed on. Yeah. So um, part of what I was doing with Toybox was undermining the ongoing BusyBox lawsuits that I had started and couldn't stop. And that freaked out a lot of the FSF guys. And that basically scared away open corporate contributions. You know, I get contributions on the mailing list from individual Japanese developers who may work at companies in their day job, and I'm not asking. So, but yeah, I can't, you know, like, do this as my day job or anything. It's all hobby programming, but I still want to change the world. So, that gets us through um, what is Toybox, why is Toybox, now we're going to get into the meat of what does Toybox actually implement. What is the task of coming up with a command line that actually you know, meets this need of making Android self-hosting? It needs to support POSIX 2008, but not all of POSIX 2008. Uh, POSIX 2008 has a lot of obsolete crap in it. It still, uh, it still specifies the SCCS control system, which predates CVS and makes it look good. Um, it still specifies ed. It still has a dozen batch processing commands like qdel and stuff. So I triaged POSIX 2008, and there is a, uh, a roadmap is one of these tabs I have open. Well, ooh. So there's a roadmap that explains goals and use cases of you know, POSIX 2008, the Linux standard base, the standard isn't scare quotes for a reason, um, what it takes to be a good development environment, what's actually in Android Toolbox, and then various other packages that do similar things like Calibc, um, Standalone Shell, SBase, S6, Red Hat's old Nash project, which apparently died in 2008, and having looked at it, they had good reason to kill it. And uh, Beastie Box, which was uh, some BSD guys vented some BusyBox envy for a while into uh, GitHub in 2008 and then stopped and haven't touched it since. But all of these have a selection of commands that they thought were important to include. So I triaged all of these and put together a status page of, OK, POSIX commands, LSV commands, things that are needed by development environment, uh, that Aboriginal Linux needed to rebuild itself under itself and build Linux from scratch under the result. Um, commands that are in Android, commands that are in Klibc, Sash, Sbase, BeastieBox, 
things that were requested by you know, various people emailed me and said, I would like to use this, but I really need blah. Um, and the crossed out ones are the ones that are already implemented. So there's you know, all commands. I break it up into the things that are still to do and the things that are done. You know, so these are implemented. Um, so let's go back to here. So on the web page, you can actually get a lot of the stuff that I'm going over now. Um, so POSIX is a very good standard. Its failure mode is emission or having things in it that should have been deprecated. Uh, it hangs on to stuff for a while once it's standardized it, and it doesn't mention the existence of mount or init. So if you have a system with nothing but POSIX in it, it won't boot. Um, LSB 4.1, the Linux standard base, supplements it to give you a system that will mostly actually boot, although it still doesn't specify init. But it is a deeply crappy standard. Half of it is deprecating, is reversing deprecations in POSIX. Things that POSIX did manage to get rid of after hanging on to them for too long, LSB puts back. Um, the Linux standard base documents what's there without a whole lot of judgment about what should be there. Um, it, it has pointy hair disease in, in certain cases. But it's still a good source of information. If you're implementing a mount command, you might as well make it uh, conform to LSB 4.1's command line things. Uh, Android Toolbox lives in the Android Core Git repository. Um, so breaking it out of Android, you know, Android has a fairly significant not invented here syndrome, and this is one of their sort of crown jewels. Um, so the easy thing to do is just put Toybox first in the path and leave Toolbox there for now. Um, I triaged it. Um, I mentioned uh, making sure we have good container support for security. Um, what's involved in a development environment? I gave a talk here in 2010 that's still online, and the slides are uh, the slides are online as well, all 260 of them. Basically, I have a wrapper that appends the command line it's called with to a log file, and then calls the next thing in the path with the same name it was called under. So you make a directory with this wrapper in it, symlink every binary name in the path to this wrapper, and stick it at the start of your path, and it logs everything that's called out of the path after that. And then I have some scripts that'll you know, run sed and awk against this to give you a list of these are all the commands that were actually called and what stage called them. So I've, I've been looking for years at what's involved in a minimal you know, self-hosting environment. I got that one down. And I also have enough for it to build Linux from scratch uh, natively on target. Um, I don't separately have to look at BusyBox because the reason that I became BusyBox maintainer was so that Aboriginal Linux could rebuild itself under itself and build the whole of Linux from scratch with BusyBox providing all of its command line utilities that weren't actually the compiler or the linker. And I did that. And BusyBox def config has about twice as much stuff as I actually need. And I've already triaged that down. Um, I looked at the other packages, klibc, sash, uh, and so on. And if you go to the roadmap, there's actually specific you know, triaging of each of the packages if you're interested in this is, you know, this, this first list is everything that it provides. The second list is what's still on the to-do list that before I can say to the users of Sash, Toybox does everything that Sash did, you know, if you wanted to switch. Um, because, you know, as always, uh, when you attempt to replace things in a, in a heavily fragmented environment, there is the danger of just fragmenting it further if, you know, you can't convince anybody to move off of what they're already doing. So things it should have. It should have good container support. And unfortunately, I can't tell you today what good container support means because it's still a moving target. It should have network administration stuff because you need that. That's not in POSIX and that's not really in LSB. Um, it should have file system support because Android Toolbox has make FATFS and I already did make swap and once that can of worms is opened, maybe it should have some of the others. Um, I could be talked out of including it, but they're actually not very hard because they're essentially just more archivers and I want to implement this, them as archivers so that you can, you know, do a makey2fs on a directory, pipe the output to gzip, gzip and SSH it to another machine. You can't do that with a jenny2fs right now because it's a big mmap that does random seeks. Um, 
MDEV is BusyBox's UDEV replacement. I designed that in the first place. Toybox should, uh, should have it, but it should be based on dev tempfs because some of that stuff went upstream. Init is one big unsolved problem. There's Sys5 init, there's Androids init, there's Upstart. Um, System D needs to die. Um, I, I'm not opening that can of worms because, again, I couldn't tell you what the edges of it are. Uh, the Katamari de Macy theme plays in my head whenever I read about it. Um, Toybox has something called one it. Um, there's also run it in BusyBox. I'm, I have to do more study here to figure out how I want to handle a knit. I'm probably going to lean towards whatever's Android's, whatever Android's doing, I need to implement that because the main use case is replacing that. Um, it needs a shell that's a reasonable bash replacement. Um, I could go into why Ubuntu replacing bash with dash was the worst technical decision they have ever made, and I can back that up, but um, we don't have time. Um, some things are more complicated than they seem and should not be in Toybox. A lot of maintaining a project well is, say, is what can I say no to? What, what are the edges of my project? If I can't say what shouldn't be involved, I don't know where the edges of my project are and it's going to turn into a giant unmaintainable mess. Various blue sky would be nice things like a hex editor, a nine piece uh, file system server, IOTOP, Linus's copy of Micro Emacs. If I can clone that, maybe I can get him to start using it. That would be nice. Um, I doubt it, but you know, never know. Um, Netcat's UDP mode, Microterm rsync, who is KXX screen, NTP slash R date, HTTPD or DNSD, maybe. Uh, memory technology device stuff. This is all maybe after 1.0 things or if I, you know, get bored. And then there's a bunch of things that are in like POSIX. For, for example, make is in POSIX, lex is in POSIX, POSIX specifies a C99 command. That belongs in the tool chain, okay? That does not belong in Toybox. Um, if I was going to add strace, I'd add it to a tool chain package. Um, if I was going to re-implement expect, which is a nice thing because killing off tickle would, you know, would be nice, but that doesn't belong here. Um, the record commands raptor. So, that's basically my, my indexy thing, and I probably don't have any time left, but at this point, questions? Yes? So, uh, has, it, is there, has there been any comparison done on how big it is compared to BusyBox? Yes. Um, in fact, I have. I, I've, been, I've been tracking that and keeping the size down. BusyBox does some tricks to keep its size down that are like weird linker flags to remove elf sections and stuff. And I'm focusing on simple first and speed second and size and all that. I actually have, uh, if you go to landly.net slash toybox, there's a uh, what is toybox thing that includes a bunch of uh, goals and things and you know the standards and stuff. And the design docs actually explain, you know, that it needs to be fast, it needs to be simple, it needs to be small and stuff like that, but simple is the simplest implementation that provides the necessary feature set, and then a little bit of extra complexity to reduce size or increase speed, but complexity is a cost, and we want to spend as little of it as possible, because complexity essentially reduces auditability, and we really need security. Okay, we need this code to be as transparent as possible so that lurking bugs that, you know, cause the smartphone equivalent of the Morris worm aren't our, aren't our fault. Did that answer your question? Okay, other questions? None? Okay, well, thanks for listening.